Take your Bible, if you would, tonight to uh, first the Scripture to begin with, and that would be uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. We're going to read a couple of Scriptures, and then I'll dive in and answer the questions. And like I said earlier, I'll do my best to get through as many questions as I can. And uh, if I don't, uh, perchance, uh, answer the question that you have or that you've submitted uh, fully this evening, then just come see me and maybe we can sit down some time. We can uh, work out some of the details and, and work further uh, through all of this. But 2 Timothy chapter number uh, 3, and chapter number 2, and we'll look at 3 also, but 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 15 says this, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman or a workwoman. It's a generic term here. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately or rightly handling or dividing the word of truth. I grew up uh, maybe understanding that verse and I memorized it in King James study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It is important and that as believers in Jesus Christ, that we not be, uh, when we come into church, that we not check our brains at the door and just come in and say, well, you know, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You know, no, that, we don't want to be that kind of way. Uh, we want to come in and say, okay, this is God's holy word. It is inerrant and infallible and inspired. And I'm going to use the brain that God gave me, the mind that he gave me, along with the spirit of God who is indwelling me, And I am going to learn His Word. I'm going to study. I'm going to ask hard questions. And I'm going to seek after truth all my life through the Scriptures. Now Jesus said you should know the truth and the truth shall set you or make you free. And so we want to study hard to be approved to God and that we rightly divide the Word of God. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16 and 17. Speaking here of Timothy, Paul says, And that from a childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man, woman, boy, or girl of God, so that the man of God, this person may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so God's Word is inspired, it is infallible, it is inerrant. What we, what we simply mean by this is that when you open the written Word of God, it is God's Word. And it is authoritative for all of our lives. It is authoritative not only for believers, but for unbelievers as well too. There will come a day where those that do not believe in Jesus, they will be judged, and what they will be judged by is the word of the living God. It stands, whether you want it to or not, the Bible is the authoritative document for your life. And so all of us together are to bring ourselves to a point of submission where we bow before the word of God, and we seek to understand it. We, we are never above God's Word. We never stand in judgment on God's Word. What we do is bow beneath it. We read it, we interpret it, we understand it, and then we obey the Word of God. And so uh, I just want to encourage you that in all of your life, look to God's Word as the authority for your life, and then live that out. All right. Here are the questions for this evening. I get, to, uh, I get a softball question to begin with, all right? And if you'll notice, our children are, or some of our children are with us this evening. Some of the harder questions that we'll get to tonight, they ask. Isn't that great? And they've got good minds and are asking good questions. So all of you back there, now you pay attention, and I'm going to try and answer some of your questions, all right? But here's the softball question I was given first. What, is my, what are my favorite Old Testament and New Testament books? You ready for that? I, I, that's an easy one. We'll get, okay, we're done now. No, I'm just messing with you. Uh, favorite Old Testament and New Testament book. My favorite Old Testament book is the book of Deuteronomy. Because Deuteronomy uh, stands at the end of the Pentateuch, and it really is a seam, all right, 
between the Torah or the, the first five books of the Bible and all the rest of the prophets and the writings. And so if you understand Deuteronomy well, you not only understand everything that's going on in the Old Testament, but it is pointing you toward the greater picture of the coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, Moses says in Deuteronomy, there is coming a prophet that is greater than me. And all the rest of the uh, prophets in the Old Testament and the writings of the Old Testament are searching and looking for the prophet that is coming that is greater than Moses. Uh, so that's my favorite Old Testament book. My favorite New Testament book, I get two, all right? Uh, my favorite gospel is the Gospel of Mark. And my favorite other book in the New Testament is the book of Colossians. And they say, Steve, why do you like Mark so much? Well, I wish I had some great theological point of view like I did for Deuteronomy. But really, I kind of have a little bit of an ADD personality. You know, some of y'all that know me well know I'm a little bit bouncing around. And Mark is the best gospel for ADD people. It is short, it is sweet, it's to the point. You don't have to read any genealogies. And every time you turn around, Mark is saying, and immediately, immediately, immediately. And that's the way I like it. And so it just cuts right to the chase, tells you everything you need to know about Jesus. And beautiful, wonderful book. So if you're the kind of person that has a little bit of an attention span problem, read the Gospel of Mark. You'll be good to go, all right? And uh, what about Colossians? Well, I think that uh, you ever play that game where if you're stranded on a desert island and you could only have one book to your name, what, what would you take? I would take, the, I would take the small book of Colossians because Colossians is not only the gospel in a nutshell, it is all of the scripture in a nutshell. It is both indicative and imperative. You say, oh my goodness, what do those water cooler words mean? It just simply means Colossians tells you everything that God has done for you and what God requires of you. And I love that. Colossians 3 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. Colossians 3.17 is my favorite verse in the Bible. In fact, I've got, a, I've got the reference uh, imprinted on the uh, inside of my class ring. I love Colossians 3.17. It just uh, fuels what I do and how I live. And I believe everything should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just in name only, but in the power and the and the grace and the truth that comes through the name and the resources of Jesus Christ. All right, that was question number one. Um, okay, here is the second question for tonight. It gets immensely more difficult right off the bat. Here's the question. Are all sins equal? All right, shake your head if you understand the question. Are all sins equal? Anybody in here ever wondered about that? Does God view, Have you ever heard somebody say, well, a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. Every one of them's the same. Well, we might want to think about that for a minute, all right? Uh, so here's the question. Are all sins equal? Now, I am not related to Tom Tillis, the politician, but I'm about to get all politician on you. You ready? Yes and no. Yes and no. You like that political answer? Okay, so let's explain this. When we say, are all sins equal? Yes, in one category, that all sins separate us from God. The Bible says in uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin are death. Not this sin, that sin, this sin, that sin. No, but all sin, whether it's a small white lie or whether it's mass genocide, all sin separates us from God. And so in certain sense, yes, there is an equality in that all sin distances us from God because God is holy. God is never going to be in the presence of sin. God hates sin. It is against the very nature of God. And so when we sin, whether it is a lie or whether it is murder, it distances us and separates us from the holiness and the righteousness that is of God. Now, that's the yes component. Uh, a further explanation, are all sins equal? No, no, not all sins are equal. For uh, surely the Bible would say that the stealing of a loaf of bread is vastly different in character and effect and result and motivation than, say, the exterminating of a million people, right? Right? 
And so if we were to look into the Old Testament, I'll just give you a couple of chapters for tonight, but Exodus chapter number 22 and Leviticus chapter number 20, then you would find that in the Old Testament, God applied different penalties to different sins. And that suggests that there are variations in the seriousness of sin. For instance, in the Old Testament, you would find that a thief, the judgment for a thief was to pay restitution. And you would find that for somebody that would deny God or go into an occult in, the, uh, in, in Israel, that the judgment for those that would go away from God was to be cut off from the nation of Israel. But if you took somebody else's life in murder, God said their life should be taken. Do you see how the Old Testament would say if you're a thief and you get caught, you're to pay restitution. That's one level of sin and it's retribution. If you murder, you're to have your life taken away from you. You see how that is? Let me get through this one second. Well, go ahead. That's all right. We'll talk a little bit. Yeah. And the reason why the consequences are different is because the sin is different. Right? Right. That's exactly what I'm getting at. And so, yes, there is a sense in which, everybody with me here? There is a sense in which all sin separates us from God, but there is also a sense in which all sins are not equal. Taking a loaf of bread is not the same thing as exterminating six million Jews, for instance. It's a difference there. Uh, in the New Testament, um, Jesus said it would be more bearable. In fact, take your Bible, turn over to Matthew chapter number 11, verse 23 and 24. You can find here, Jesus said it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for Sodom than for Capernaum because of Capernaum's unbelief and refusal to repent after witnessing all of these miracles. He's saying there the sins of, God, God, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah, there is a difference in the level and the equality of those. The sins of Sodom were identified in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse number 21 as arrogance and gluttony and indifference to the poor and needy and haughtiness and all other detestable things. And yet, Jesus says, it'd be lighter for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than for this city that rejects me. See, difference, not an equality there. When Jesus spoke of His second coming and His judgment, He warned that among those deserving punishment that some... Look at the Luke chapter 12 and verse 47 and 48. Jesus is saying in Luke, Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and verse 48, He's saying, when I come back, I'm going to bring judgment with me on those who have not believed in me. But look what He says. He warned that among those deserving this punishment that some would be beaten with many blows and other with few blows. And that's just metaphorical language to say that some of the unbelievers left when Jesus comes in judgment will receive heavy judgment and some of them will receive lighter judgment. Okay? He also reserved His most fierce denunciation for the pride and unbelief of the religious leaders. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13 through 36, you can read through there. Some of the greatest judgment of God will be taken out on religious leaders that did not know Jesus and led people astray. So, the answer to the question is that sins are equal insofar as they separate us from God. But in degree and in result and in motivation... And in penalty, no, not all sins are seen the same. Thievery and murder are not judged upon the same level. Now let me just take a moment to give one other little avenue that this crops up sometimes. Sometimes well-meaning Christians will say to unbelievers, yeah, you're, you're going to go to hell because you're drinking. Yeah. You're going to go to hell because of this. You're going to... Listen. Nobody... No, nobody goes to hell because of isolated individual sins. People perish eternally for rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
Now, what about a text that may say, well, all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Yes, this is exactly true. But the reason why, what you need to know is, first of all, when it says all liars will have their place in the lake of fire, what it's talking about there is the person who is a habitually consumed with lying person and sees no problem in that and continues in that way. And do you know why they see no problem in it and why they continue in that way? Because they are unbelieving people. They have not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Nobody goes to hell because of all of these other little things. Right? Because otherwise we would preach to people, stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing this, start doing this, start doing this, start doing this. And we would have some sort of massive legalistic religion. The reason why people perish eternally with, uh, forever without eternal life in heaven, the reason for that is that they have never repented of their sin and trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is the answer. God is not asking, listen, when you talk to lost friends and neighbors and family members, you're not trying to reform them. You're trying to have the Spirit of God regenerate them. You're not looking to mold and fashion the same old man or old woman to something that looks a little better. You are trying to get them to die and be reborn by Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Jesus says in John chapter number 3? Except you be born again, you will in no way enter into the kingdom of God. We're not trying to reform people to be better. We're trying to get them to see that they are dead in their sins and they need to be awakened by Christ and given new life. And so, where are we trying to help people? Look, you don't have to stop and start all of these things. You need to come to Jesus just like you are. Repent of your sin, bow before Him and make Him the Lord of your life and He will change you from the inside out. Translated, as the book of Colossians says, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's Ephesians 1, 7. Sorry about that. It would have been good if it would have been in Colossians. All right? Everybody pretty clear on that? Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, okay, here's the next question. What happens if I do not share the gospel? All right? Isn't that a good question? What happened, you know, every Sunday and on the Wednesdays, I'm always preaching at us, we got to share the gospel, we got to give the gospel, we got to tell unbelievers about Jesus. What happens if we don't share the gospel, all right? Now, all of, uh, all of my faithful believers in here that have been going for a while, many of you, your first thought is, well, unbelievers will die and go to hell. We're going to get to that in a moment. But I want you to maybe have a change of thought and a little change of pattern here for a moment. We do not do evangelism primarily because lost people are going to hell. We do evangelism primarily to bring glory to God and obedience to Jesus Christ. Now, is it true that there is a motivation that Jesus says people are dying in their sins and they're going to go to eternal fiery punishment. Yes, and that should motivate us. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I want to, I want to give to the gospel as many people as I can. But that is not the first and the foremost the primary reason why we share the gospel. We share the gospel to bring glory to God because the reason why, let me borrow from, a, uh, from another author, the reason why missions and evangelism exists is because worship does not exist. You see, and so when the whole world is worshiping Christ, there'll be no need anymore for evangelism. But until the day where the whole world is worshiping Christ, we are to go. Why? Because we want to bring glory to God and we want to be obedient to the commands of Jesus. And what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter number 28? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all those things that I've commanded you, and I am with you even until the end of the age. Right? We share the gospel to bring God glory. We share the gospel to be obedient to the command of Jesus. And we share the gospel because if we don't, people will die in their sins and go to a Christless eternity. Um, I'm not so foolish as to know that a lot of our believers don't still struggle with curse words, right? 
I want to tell you, if you begin to work on any curse words, please, please be very, very careful and abstain from just flippantly telling somebody to go to hell. It is an awful place. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's a terrible place. And you wouldn't wish that upon your worst enemy. Don't do that to people. Point them to Jesus Christ and help them to understand the gospel that Jesus saved. So, what happens if we don't share the gospel? Three things. Number one, God is not glorified. Number two, Christ is not being obeyed. And number three, lost people spend eternity without Him. Now do you understand why I beat that drum every week? Go out in the world, invite people to come to church, share your testimony, share the gospel. Do you want to know why we have the craft fair on Saturday, inviting men to come to the men's uh, thing on Saturday? And you know why we do homecoming service here? You know why we do vacation Bible school and why we go to El Salvador? The reason why we do all of those things is because we want to bring God glory, we want to be obedient to Jesus Christ, and we want to see as many people as possibly can Hear the gospel, receive Jesus, and escape hell. Fair enough? All right. Uh, next question. <laughs> They're just getting easier and easier. Here we go. Is hell a place of real suffering or just separation from God? Is hell a place of real fiery torment, you know, everything that, uh, that we hear about? Is it a real, literal place of fire and judgment, or is it just simply language to be talked about about separation? Well, I want to say several things on this, but so that I get the clearest answers out as, as quickly as I can, my answer to you is yes, it is a very real place of eternal suffering. Is that clear? All right. Let me, let me show you a couple of those things from the Bible. Um, you can either turn there... Or you might just want to write down these references for sake of time tonight. All right? The punishment of the wicked in hell is described all the way throughout Scripture. Here, let me uh, get your minds ready, get your pens ready. The Bible describes hell as eternal fire in Matthew 25, 41. It describes it as unquenchable fire in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12. It describes hell as shame and everlasting contempt in Daniel 12, 2. The Bible describes hell as a place where the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter number 9, verse 44 through 49. Mark 9, 44 through 49. It describes it as a place of torment and fire. Luke 16, 23 and 24. It describes it as everlasting destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1.9. And I could go on. I, give you, I could give you another five, six, seven references, but I won't just for sake of time tonight. So let me, uh, let me do my best to make a, a few observations here for us. Is hell a place of real torment and pain and suffering, yes. Is hell, the fire of hell, is it the same kind of fire that you put in your fire pit out back, well, not when it's hot, but in the fall? I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like because the Bible describes it as fire, yes, but it also says that hell is a place of utter darkness, so I don't think there's a contradiction. I think what's going on is here in the spiritual realm, there is something that fire is representing here that it is going to be real, intense, fire-like pain, but it's going to be a fire in which we've probably not ever seen before because usually in this lifetime, in this reality, we understand that you fire and utter darkness, right? You know, usually when you have fire, there's light. Is that, is that right? Y'all shake your heads if I'm making sense here, okay? So... Yes, eternal fire, flames, utter darkness, shame, reproach, pain, torment, destruction. 
Yes. Yes. Let me tell you, folks, when I preach on hell here from the pulpit, I never preach with a skip in my step as if, hey, yeah, you bunch of unbelievers, you're going to hell. I do so with tears and pain. And I, there's been times where I've had ulcers in my mouth. I think I lose my hair more when I preach on I don't want to. But I know that it's right and I know that it's biblical. And when I preach on the doctrine of hell, I do so not wanting any person in the world to go there. And you shouldn't either. Pray for unbelievers that they would repent and turn to Jesus and not have to experience that. One more caveat on that, one more section there that some people will ask me. Somebody, uh, somebody will might ask at some time, well, how can, how can a, a finite human being, is it fair of God to, to damn someone to an eternal judgment that is only finite? You see, an eternal, infinite judgment but they are only a finite human being. Well, I think Jonathan Edwards answers this best in terms of when we understand the awfulness of our sin. The reason why hell is a legitimately justified penalty for our sin is because our sin is an infinite offense against the holiness of of God. Now, nobody in America nor around the world really wants to talk about that part of Christianity anymore, but I want you to understand that your sin and my sin is infinitely abusive and nasty and corrosive, and God hates our sin. And when we tell lies and when we gossip and when we cheat and when we steal and when we break the Ten Commandments, what we are doing is compounding and compounding and compounding sin upon sin upon sin and it is an offense to the holiness of God. God is so good and so pure and so holy that when we sin, we place ourselves justifiably into the penalty of infinite judgment. I don't have time to take you there tonight, but I want to tell you this, that those in hell will acknowledge the perfect justice of God, Psalm 76.10. They will acknowledge that their punishment is just and that they alone are to blame for their sins, Deuteronomy 32, verse 3 through 5. Let me give you the coming out of that into the redemptive mode. With all of the awfulness of hell and all of the judgment that rightly belongs on us, aren't you glad that Jesus Christ came into the world, went to the cross, and paid for your sins? The cross, in some sense, is Christ enduring the awfulness of hell for you. And he dies for us. Yes, sir. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 3 through 5. I think you'll see there that hell is a place of torment and uh, punishment. I think you'll also see there uh, that their punishment is just and that they alone are to be blamed. All right. Uh, let me move along a little bit faster. Number five... Um, Oh my goodness, these are getting easier and easier. Here we go, boys and girls. Hey, you know, our children's department submitted this question. Why didn't Jesus just make everything perfect and leave it that way? Now, I got some adults in here thinking, man, I don't have brains like that, right? That's a good question, guys and gals. Why didn't Jesus just make everything perfect and leave it that way? All right. Oh, I'm not supposed to move. All right. Got this video thing. Some of these folks wanted to do video for those that couldn't be here tonight. Uh, why didn't Jesus just make everything perfect and leave it that way? So here's the simple answer, and then I'll try and make it more difficult for you. All right? Um, the simple answer is Jesus did make everything perfect, and he expected to leave it that way. If you read to the end of Genesis chapter number 2, 
God in Genesis chapter number 1 creates all the world. And the Bible says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was very good. In Genesis chapter number 2, God puts Adam and Eve into the garden. He sets up a perfect situation for them. He loves them. He, his presence is with them. He walks with them in the cool of the day every day. And when you get to the end of Genesis chapter number 2, it is exactly like Jesus wants it to be. And he gives the command to go into all the world and to procreate and to make God worshipers all around the world. That's what they were to do. And that would have been the perfect and the right way. Jesus did make the world the right way. Do you know who made it not the right way? Us. And lest you sit in your seat and put your you know, fingers in your suspenders and think you're better than Adam or you would have done better than Eve, I assure you, you would not have. You already have a sin nature running through you. Adam and Eve sinned against God. They chose to make themselves God rather than following the God of heaven. And when they sinned in the garden... Everything else in the world went downhill after that. God is not to blame for the way that the planet is now. God is not to be blamed for the evil that exists in the world now. Evil exists in the world because we chose to go away from God. Now the good that comes out of that is that God did not obliterate the planet but he already had in place a plan whereby he would bring a second Adam, whose name would be Jesus, into the world. And in the first garden, Adam would sin against God, but in the last garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, John chapter number 18 that we'll study this Sunday, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, and he says to Peter, put away your sword, shall I not drink the cup of wrath? And what Adam could not do in the garden, Jesus did in the garden of Gethsemane. And he went to the cross and died for the sins of the world so that those who believe could be, have new creation implanted inside of them and ultimately restore the entire world to worship the King of glory. So the answer to that question is, Jesus did not make everything right and then make it go downhill. Jesus made everything right and Adam and Eve sinned against God. And it is because of our sin that the world is the way that it is. Now, that bleeds over into a second question, once again coming from our children, but I think uh, all of us would have. Why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? You ever wondered about that, right? You see how those two questions go together? Shay, you give me a little help tonight, right? Are y'all seeing that, right? Okay, why didn't Jesus make everything right and leave it that way? Okay, well, so I say Jesus makes it all right, but we made it go bad. So the question that comes behind that naturally would be, well, if God would have never put a tree in there, then Adam and Eve would have never sinned. Hence, God is at fault for this, right? Now, we need to dig into that just a little bit because that's not exactly uh, right. So why did God put the tree? Somebody asked me a, few, a week or so ago, they asked me, did God set Adam and Eve up for failure when he put the tree in the garden? You ever thought about that? Was God just doing a backdoor job on them? Yeah, set them up to fall? God is guilty of entrapment. No, no, not at all. Now, has everybody, uh, everybody got your thinking caps on with me? Because I'm about to talk to you about some things here for a minute, and you really need to think, all right? You ready? Did y'all have dinner yet? Some of you are yawning and sleeping on me. Now listen, think hard with me. You ready? I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible for you. When God created Adam and Eve, He was creating something different. Human beings. He created human beings in His image so that we are not just a higher form of animals. You will never see a lion tear open a gazelle on the field of Africa and with blood dripping down its mane say, oh my goodness, should I have done that? What are the moral ramifications for me taking the life of the gazelle? Do you know why lions don't do that? Because they do not bear the image of God inside of them. 
Human beings were created distinct from animal and plant life with the image of God. The Bible says that God formed man and woman from the dust of the ground, breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, and they became a living being. To be created in God's image means a couple of things. It means many things, but a couple of things that it means is one, that we have moral responsibility, but that is birthed out of the fact that when God created humans, He gave them the ability to choose. Freedom. Now, I don't have time for all of my theologians to get all of the facets of this, but listen to me. When God made human beings, He made them with some form of freedom. That is, that in myself and in yourself, when Adam and Eve was created, that part of what it means to be a human is that you really can own a decision. So when, when Adam was created, he's there in the garden, and God, being sovereign, is able to grant limited sovereignty to a human being. And God respected the human that he created in his image with the ability to have freedom and choice so much that we are even able to deny our maker. Nothing else in nature does that. Trees only are trees. Human beings have the capacity to reject God. Part of what it means to be a human is to have some sense some form of liber liberty, freedom, the ability to choose. However you work that out. That being the case, when Adam and Eve came into the world, they woke up every day leaning toward obeying God. That was part of their holiness. That was part of what it meant to be without sin in the world. Hey, has anybody in here ever taught their child how to sin? No? You never taught your children how to lie? Did they just not know how to do that automatically? Right? We have to teach children now how to be good. That's not the way Adam and Eve were created. In the same way that your children always have the propensity to lean toward evil, when Adam and Eve came into the world, they had the propensity to lean toward God every time. But in order to see if Adam and Eve would truly worship God... God placed a moral test in their way. And He put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil into the garden. And He said, I respect you as I've made you with freedom so much that I'm going to give you the choice. That's why God put the tree in the garden. And we, through Adam and Eve, chose willingly to go against God. Now you might say, well, why, why did God have to even make that? Why couldn't God, why is there any bad at all? Why can't God just override uh, and there never be anything wrong and God make sure we make all the right decisions every time? What you have to ask is, do you want to live in a world like that? Because that is not what a human is. If God forced human beings to always choose what He wanted, you would be a puppet or a robot or an angel. Now, did I just shoot for the stars? Or are you guys with me on some capacity here? Okay. God did not make the world that way. And I would submit to you, I want to live in a world where human beings are responsible for their choices and have some sort of genuine, real love for God. Not because it's been forced, but because I've been wooed and convicted and moved by the love and the grace of God to love Him. Now, 
One last caveat and move to the next one. Don't take what I've said tonight as if you can run out of here saying, I am a tabula rasa, I am a clean slate, I am so neutral, every decision that comes my way, I can either choose right or wrong, I can choose heaven or hell, I can choose Jesus or not, mm, not so much. Because every free decision you've made all of your life has been bent toward evil. And you've made so many of them that you are trapped in the prison of your own nature. And except Christ breaks into the prison and brings you out, you will never choose Him. Now that might have been a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper answer than we want to get in tonight. I hope that makes sense. If some of you have questions, uh, see me about that. We've got about three or four minutes left. Let me see. I might be able to answer one. Well, we've got three minutes left. How about that? Um, oh, uh, okay, here's one. Uh, I think, children, I think this came from you too. Why do, why do we call it the Bible? Is that, everybody got one of these? Hold them up. I just want to see something tonight. Y'all got them? Okay. Why do we call it, is, I think that came from children's department. Why do we call this the Bible? Okay. So the word Bible, uh, listen, everybody, is everybody interested in that? All right, listen. So the word, the English word Bible is, comes from a Greek word. Hey, now, listen to me. The English word Bible comes from the Greek word biblos. Biblos is a term for the inner part of the papyrus plant. Oh, my goodness, I just put everybody to sleep. The, the papyrus plant um, is, uh, the inner part of the papyrus plant is what they would used to, they would, they would take it out, they would stretch it out, they would dry it out, and then they would actually write, like we do on paper. Well, most of you don't write on paper anymore. You'd type it on your computers or text it in or whatever. But back in the ancient days when we used pen and paper, papyrus is a form of paper. It's what they would write scrolls on. And so Biblos was, that, was speaking about the papyrus in which a book would be written. And so Biblos came to mean book. And when we think about the book, we just talk about the Bible as being the book, right? You ever say to somebody, he's the man, she's the woman. What do you mean when you put the the in front of it, right? That's the man. That's the most important one, first in stature. So when we say the Bible or the Biblos, we're talking about the book that comes from God to us. So Bible comes from Biblos, which is a part of a plant that was used for writing Scripture down upon. And uh, the last question I'll answer tonight, uh, this would take probably... I don't know, maybe an 18-month seminar to answer, but I'm just going to do my best to give you about a one-and-a-half-minute answer, all right? Why is there an Old Testament and a New Testament? So you want my simple answer? Everybody's like, yeah, please give us that so we can get out of here. Simple answer is there is no Old Testament and New Testament. There is one book that is divided into a couple of sections. Hey, say, Steve, are you playing games there? Are you splitting hairs? No, I'm not. What I want you to understand is that the Bible is one in unity, and from Genesis to Revelation, it is one continuous storyline. It is not broken into two separate books. The Bible starts in Genesis chapter 1 in the garden and it ends in Revelation 22 in the garden. It begins with creation in Genesis 1 and it ends in Genesis 22 with recreation of the entire world. It begins in Genesis talking about Adam, the first Adam, and it ends in the New Testament with Jesus who is the second Adam. It begins on Mount Moriah with Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 and it ends on Mount Calvary with Jesus dying on on the cross. It begins in Genesis chapter number 3 as we look for the seed that will come and it ends in the New Testament when we find that Jesus is the seed of Israel. One book, two parts. What's the distinction? The Old Testament is all of it is prophesying and pointing us 
toward the coming of the Messiah. And when we get to the New Testament, the Gospels, it is the unfolding and the telling of God's Messiah. And the rest of the New Testament is telling us, looking back at the Messiah. One book, two sections. Now, we could talk about that for a long period of time, but that's the best that I would tell you. I don't want you to think about a whole bunch of different books. What I want you to think about is one unified book one part of the book telling you about the coming of the Messiah and one part telling you about Christ and the Messiah when He's here. Right? Some people say it this way, that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Right? That's a tongue twister for you. Well, I'll tell you what, let's have a word of prayer.